Hi everyone, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the fact that you are showing interest in the Orchid Lingo series. And today the subject du jour is pseudobulbs. There's a few disclaimers I want to make right off the bat, because if my voice starts to sound monotone, it's because I'm reading off of notes. I had to take down notes because my mind is wandering. I have been suffering from severe headaches and that doesn't help with concentration and keeping the flow. So I apologize if it doesn't sound like free flow the way I normally speak. I want to do this subject justice. And for that reason, notes. Secondly, I may not have all the examples that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to try and include as much footage as I have and examples that I have in my own collection with regards to the subject of pseudobulbs. So if you're staring at a Prostechia cochleata variety lancifolia being photobombed by a Tolumnia pomegranate, thank you very much for staring at this beautiful image, in my opinion. <laughs> if the footage is missing, I hope what I talk about will explain enough of what I'm trying to say. And lastly, if I do not cover everything regarding the subject of pseudobulbs, the comments are there for a reason. Please add your thoughts and share them with everybody else that goes to the comments to find more information. Thank you very, very much. Let's start right off the back with the duh about orchid lingo and when it comes to pseudobulbs. Pseudobulbs only grow on sympodial orchids and not monopodial orchids. So anything Phalaenopsis, Vanda, Doria Ternopsis, Renantheras, etc. Those are monopodial orchids. They do not have pseudobulbs. Every orchid in the category of Cattleya, Dendrobium, Oncidium, Prostechia, Coilostylis, they have pseudobulbs and they are sympodial orchids, meaning that they grow along a rhizome. And now we're going to get to breaking down the word of pseudobulbs. In layman's terms, pseudo means false, pretense, not real, or an imitation. And that is quite clear to see that we have a bulbous structure or even a long structure, but it is still a pseudobulb and it is not terrestrial. So this is kind of a fake bulb, so to speak. They are absolutely marvelous adaptive structures that store water and nutrients, sustaining the orchids in times of drought. And the new pseudobulbs grow from the bases of older pseudobulbs, which is then the creeping rhizome. And when we see an eye, that is the start of a new pseudobulb. Now you could say that orchids with pseudobulbs are sensitive to water quality and quantity, as well as fertilizer and air pollution. But that applies to all orchids. Just know that growing a pseudobulb is a little bit more intricate than just, yay, here's a new growth and we are on our way. There's more to cultivating a pseudobulb than meets the eye. Speaking, of course, of the water quality and quantity, fertilizer and air pollution, all these factors are generally known to be very, very vital when cultivating orchids in our collection. We always speak about, oh, but they grow in the wild and then this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen. There's nobody around to take care of the she's, the pests, etc. Yes, that is in the wild, different elements, humidity, airflow, etc. All of that is a natural process that they have adapted to. So what we're doing in our environment, in our cultivation, is bringing in these gorgeous creatures and trying to replicate what they get out in nature. And more often than not, we don't have the similar conditions. And for that reason, we need to take care of our pseudobulbs with a little bit more precision than letting them run wild out in nature, where most of what I'm gonna say doesn't even factor in. So just bear in mind the water quality that we apply to cultivate new growths equals new pseudobulbs. In nature, it's rainwater. It's the cleanest water that there is. And we don't always have rainwater. The water quality for orchids is important. Orchids pretty much tell us, are we getting it right? Or is our environment totally wrong? They are not forgiving if we get the environment wrong. 
So when we talk about water quality to cultivate pseudobulbs, that obviously goes for the entire orchid. But with sympodial orchids, pseudobulbs are fundamental for the rest of the health of the orchid. The same goes with fertilizer. I know that we strive as growers to get bigger and better structures as the orchid matures throughout the years in our possession. So fertilizer is really, really important. But we don't want to over fertilize either because of the slow metabolism of the orchid. So that's another factor. Fertilizing is fundamental for the health of the pseudobulb. Air pollution as well. There's a lot of transpiration going on with the orchid and the air. It's all a fine balance through the leaves, through the roots, absorbing nutrients out of the air. So if the air isn't right, our orchids are also going to tell us and the pseudobulb will probably tell us very, very quickly because if it doesn't develop properly, then there is something wrong and we can break that down into different factors and try to narrow down what is going wrong. The pseudobulb is like the messenger of the orchid. Even if it is small and immature, it already is sending messages out to us with regards to how well is the growth growing? Are the roots in the pot functioning? Is the nutrient absorption optimal? So keeping an eye on pseudobulbs as they develop is for me a major, major fun part of watching my orchid grow. The pseudobulb is also like an open book. There's only so much storage in emergency situation that a pseudobulb can handle until its capacity has been exhausted and it shrivels up and can no longer serve its purpose. So this is something where I say an open book. This can happen mainly because of root loss. Most of our orchid issues happen because there's something wrong in the pot. They are no longer able to absorb the water. The nutrient uptake is then stalled as well. So the reserves are being depleted. The pseudobulb being a storage organ for our orchids. That is what makes this hobby relatively forgiving that if we have healthy pseudobulbs, if we make a mistake, we may set the orchid back a little bit, but anything that we have in storage as a backup will give us the opportunity to save the orchid up to a certain point because it is not an organism that can hold on to water forever if it has to use up those reserves in order to maintain the survival of the orchid. But it's not just about our water quality or the air. It's not all about the roots because a pest infestation can also cause serious, serious damage in the development of our pseudobulbs, especially if there was a pest outbreak that was not detected on time. These little bleep, <laughs> They come into the tender, tender start of the growth of our pseudobulbs, sucking out the cells between the rhizome and the rest of the structures, which means they are cutting off the supply of nutrients and water at the base. So despite being visually strong structures, pseudobulbs are very, very delicate and prone to break easily, to get destroyed, to get chewed up, to incur rot, all these little factors is not a guarantee that a pseudobulb can actually develop to its full potential. Once a pseudobulb has also grown to its full potential and looks beautiful, lush, and glossy the way we like it, that is still a danger point and should not be taken lightly when it comes to possible breakage because a strong, well-grown pseudobulb can snap very, very easily, whereas a weaker, desiccated pseudobulb might have a bit of flex to it in the structure and then it won't break but a strong one it will snap and that is to be mindful of as well once a growth is grown that doesn't mean it's there to stay if we are not careful that is the irony of growing a pseudobulb well but if you do have a very well grown pseudobulb and it's snapped it would be a clean break which is easier to treat than something that has been destroyed through smashing or crushing. And as with any wound, sealing a cut or a break on a pseudobulb it is vital to stop any pathogens from being able to enter the structure. Infection prevention is paramount if the pseudobulb is to be saved, even if it is partial. For the orchid, that partial structure will still serve a purpose. Sealing cuts with cinnamon immediately dries out the wound and stops any chance of pathogens doing further damage. And dragon's blood is also super effective depending on how the wound presents itself. If the wound stems from a clean cut, there is a clean break. 
then cinnamon works best, bearing in mind the wound is easily accessible for all the cinnamon to reach every exposed area. Dragon's blood, however, is better for harder to reach wounds as it is a liquid and can seep into all the areas of the wound without drying out any nearby roots, which could be a side effect when using powdery cinnamon. Either way, if it is possible to save a partial suitable then it should be saved. The partial structure still has growing points at its base and will still grow roots if the break or wound is two or three centimeters above the rhizome. The function of a pseudobulb doesn't stop at the base if it is compromised above the rhizome to a certain degree. Get too close to the new growing points, the eyes, then of course that area is compromised and there won't be any more growth from that area. But more often than not, if there's damage to a pseudobulb, it happens a little bit above that area. So yes, we've lost a structure, but we haven't lost its functionality at the base. So bear that in mind if it were to happen to you. Roots will still grow and eyes will still develop from that area. My fascination with pseudobulbs also is about their shapes and their sizes. You can get circular, ellipsoid or conical, tetragonal, tapered, reverse tapered, fusiform, globular, cylindrical, slender, cane-like, as in dendrobiums, and oboboid, like an upside-down egg. A general cross-section of a pseudobulb exposes the vascular bundles, and if you were to cut into all those structures, even though the shapes may look different based on the shape of the pseudobulb, but if you were to take a cross section of a pseudobulb, it exposes vascular bundles, water storage cells, and fibers holding the whole thing together. When a pseudobulb has naturally depleted, I'm not talking about rot, just naturally depleted, and the rest of the orchid has absorbed all the nutrients out of that pseudobulb, what you are left with is a fibrous net, like I call it pantyhose structure that is soft in touch, not squishy. Squishy equals rot, but soft to the touch and somewhat dry. And then if you try to tear that apart, there is resistance. It is quite incredible what is inside what we see as beautiful green bulbous structures on the outside. So when we see new growths coming and the new pseudobulbs forming, we are already anticipating blooms. That's why we grow these orchids. That's why we pick the ones we want to grow in our collection. But it is not guaranteed that a spike will always form out of the apex of a pseudobulb. In Oncidiums, for example, the base produces the spike or spikes, as well as in some cattleyas and epidendrums. The pseudobulb is there for storage, it adds to the roots, but it is not there to be growing a spike out of the top of it. As a golden rule, that is not the case. So cattleyas and epidendrums, some of them will actually grow their spikes from the base of a pseudobulb. It looks as if there is a new growth coming, but it turns out it is a spike. Dendrobiums, for example, the pseudobulb has nodes along its entirety of the cane. When we say cane, we actually mean pseudobulb because that is what it is. It just looks longer elongated and that's where the verbiage of cane crept in. But correctly spoken, dendrobiums have pseudobulbs just like any other sympodial orchid. Just because it's long doesn't mean it's not a pseudobulb. When anybody says cane, it means they're talking about the pseudobulb. So the pseudobulb on a dendrobium has nodes all the length of it. And from those nodes, spikes will develop. And then there are some dendrobiums that grow a pseudobulb. And from the top of the pseudobulb, spikes will emerge and it will bloom out of the top of the structure of the mature pseudobulb. So don't be confused when you hear canes as opposed to pseudobulb. A cane is a pseudobulb. The spikes will grow along the nodes in the case of dendrobiums. When it comes to how the pseudobulb grows, we always see the protective sheaths around them. And it is exactly there for a reason, protection. But without enough humidity or airflow, it can cause serious problems, especially in cultivation. And I say it like that because if our environment doesn't provide enough humidity or airflow, the sheaths themselves can become a problem. 
temperature has a lot to do with it as well. We can again go back to why out in nature, nobody is peeling sheaths back, everything is just being handled, there is no issues with pests, etc. Now, the latter may or may not be true. The issues with the pest in the wild is probably something that we don't recognize, but the orchid in the wild is much more robust than anything that we can cultivate in our private environment. It's like putting an animal into a zoo. If we don't provide the right space, if we don't provide the right nutrition, if we don't provide the right environment, vegetation, etc., for that animal in the zoo to thrive, including temperature, that animal is going to get sick. And it's the same with our orchids. So the sheaths, for example, are there for protection of the orchid. That is how they've evolved over the millennium. But in our cultivation, we don't always have the same conditions nailed down, meaning our sheaths might dry out too soon, they might stay wet too long because of lower temperatures, and they may also incur pests because of the environment that we have. We have to be really vigilant to keep those sheaths in top condition because they are there to protect the growing pseudobulb. Removing the sheath prematurely from around the shape of the pseudobulb as it is developing will cause problems for the further development of the pseudobulb. Saying that if a pseudobulb is super well cultivated, for example, and we've got the right nutrition, water, and everything is going well, and this is a stonking, great looking growth, but we remove the sheath too soon, the membrane, the cell structure around the immature pseudobulb is not able to take what is happening. It will grow too fast and it will crack. And that will then again allow room for pathogens to come in, infections, rot. Cinnamon, dragon's blood, and the pseudobulb will be fine. It'll just have a crack in it. So you see that the sheaths and the pseudobulb they work in conjunction with each other, one serving a purpose so that the other can grow to the best of its ability and then serve its purpose. Once a sheath is dry, in our cultivation, highly recommended to peel it off. Pests coming in to those sheaths, those nooks and crannies, not a good idea, especially if they start at the base. They will suck out the energy and we don't want them to destroy the communication between the roots, the vascular tissue leading up to the further development and growth of the pseudobulb. So it is very, very important to be vigilant at all times when there is a new growth growing, that there's no interference with what is happening at the base, even if the growth is already halfway to maturing. The structure of a pseudobulb, remember, will be tender for a very, very long time, even after the outer sheath has dried off, even after the pseudobulb itself has matured. You can bruise them, bump them, burn them in the sun, or scratch them with a nail, as has happened in my case. And the beauty of pseudobulbs as well, it gives us the opportunity for propagation and dividing an orchid either if it's getting too large for the pot, getting too large for its space, or if you want to gift it away. Rule of thumb is three pseudobulbs, three growths per division. Now that is all relative as well. Please make sure that if you're dividing your orchid to give away, that you also go by the size of a pseudobulb. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of different sizes of pseudobulbs and they all have different levels of storage. A slender one, a thin one, like in some Lelias, will not guarantee you a propagation success if you only take three pseudobulbs. I have tried to propagate a Lelia perinei with five structures in the back. I was only so successful up to the smallest growth starting a new eye and then it collapsed. So the size of your pseudobulbs will give you a marker as to how many structures you leave in a division or if you can get away with just three. In many, many hybrids, the vigor of the orchid is much, much different than when you're working with a species. So bear in mind what orchid you're working with and how big are the structures that you are going to do as a division. In some hybrids, it is possible to propagate, surprise, just using one pseudobulb and it will work. The orchid, okay, it's gonna take a long time to bloom, but it can be done when it comes to hybrids. When it comes to species, I would always, always err on the side of caution and say, three is great, 
four or five is better when it comes to dividing and then making sure that both sections are able to continue without too much of a setback. The front part of a division with pseudobulbs will always be a little bit more vigorous than the back part. But the beauty of this propagation system is that A, you can divide your orchid. It is a rescue mode mission as well. If there's anything happening with your orchid, you have storage organs that will help you save that orchid. And it will encourage dormant eyes along the rhizome to reactivate if all goes well. And more often than not, if you have enough storage organs, enough pseudobulbs in your division, activation of a dormant eye will happen. Know that the back part of any propagation method will take time to develop another functioning, blooming pseudobulb. The first growth will always be a little bit smaller, but any pseudobulb that develops will produce roots. As I mentioned before, if you destroy a pseudobulb above a certain margin, it is not a problem. The eyes are intact, it will grow roots. The same with any smaller new growth coming after a propagation, after a division, it will grow roots. So keeping the pseudobulbs healthy is fundamental for everything else that the orchid is supposed to do after it has matured the pseudobulb. It is very easy to recognize an unhealthy pseudobulb. It is wrinkled, it is going maybe yellow, not because of high light, but a yellow, a wet yellow. Very easy to distinguish between a lalia as opposed to possible infection, bacterial infection creeping in. If the pseudobulb is wrinkled and it has something to do with the characteristics of a species, then that's fine. If the pseudobulb is a little bit soft to the touch and it is yellow, there is a problem and you will want to get rid of that very, very quickly, cutting into healthy tissue as best as possible, sealing it with cinnamon or with dragon's blood. If you cannot cut into healthy tissue, by the time you get to the lower part of the pseudobulb, trying to maintain the eyes and the roots, then go into the rhizome, but get rid of anything that is soft and yellow. A healthy pseudobulb, like on a Lelia purpurata, for example, if it is firm and it looks yellow, that is a characteristic of that species. A shriveled pseudobulb usually has issues with something in the pot, and that is the subject of roots. A totally different orchid lingo video, but watering, if there's a problem in the pot, will not plump up your pseudobulb because that means there's a problem in the pot which needs to be addressed. And by that time it is possible, you've got dead roots, and then it's time to save the orchid. There is no need to cut off a shriveling pseudobulb. It is possible that afterwards, when the orchid is somewhat rescued, new roots, etc., will plump up those older shriveled pseudobulbs in the long term. So do not just go cutting away if you see a shriveled pseudobulb. It doesn't mean that it is done and dusted. It just means you need to address something, possibly the root system, in the pot. And once that is addressed, either the older pseudobulb will revive itself and somewhat bounce back, or during the process of trying to save the orchid, the pseudobulb will deplete, which you then can cut off after it has dried up. But going in and chopping off any kind of wrinkled pseudobulb prematurely is not going to help the orchid. Whatever is left in that pseudobulb is still functioning and is still being drawn upon for the rest of the orchid to survive. Seedling pseudobulbs may die off, that is normal, as long as the front of the orchid looks healthy. Once again, know that your pseudobulb is like reading a book. Knowing your orchid is also important because some pseudobulbs will always have a natural wrinkle to them. And even after a time when the front is still looking plump and nice, the back starts to wrinkle. There is no detriment to the orchid. That is the nature of the orchid. As soon as a pseudobulb has done its task, the front might continue to look lush and the back starts to get ridges. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong in your pot. That is a characteristic of the orchid. The prostechia that you see in front of you has very, very old pseudobulbs. Even some have dropped leaves. That is normal. That doesn't mean there's a problem because you can see that even the oldest bulbs are still plump and fresh. So if I turn the orchid around without damaging a Tolumnia spike up there, you can see that I have bulbs that have lost their leaves all in the back here. 
but they're still plump and nice and fresh. They are storage structures for the rest of the orchids. Leaf drop does not mean you have an issue with your pseudobulb unless it is a pseudobulb that is right at the front of the rhizome and then you might want to see what is going on once again in the pot. As long as the pseudobulb in some species and some hybrids stays plump and fresh, it can be five years old, it can be 10 years old, it's plump, leave it be. When it comes to do a division, then that back storage bulb will serve its purpose to propagate the orchid. And then this is the great candidate, for example, to talk about just propagating. If I were to go in, I could theoretically get one, two, three, let's say four cuts out of this orchid four divisions if I went by the rule of sum of three pseudobulbs to divide the orchid with. But once again, despite this being beautiful plump structures, if I were to divide this orchid, I would only do half. The more pseudobulbs on an orchid to divide, the better. That means both pieces won't end up stalling and they will then have all the energy that they need to give the maximum joy on the next growth, which means blooms. So it is a risk to divide an orchid, but with the most pseudobulbs that you can do without going to the minimum of three pseudobulbs, you can still have a great division that within the next season will bloom. This is a very long video staring at pseudobulbs. I'm just going to preempt now the amount of time I have talked that I probably don't have all the footage that I would need in order to address all the topics that I talked about today. So if you're still here at this point, let me say thank you very, very much. I so appreciate it. I know it is so much nicer to look at videos with all pictures flashing left, right and center makes it much more appealing than staring at, well, I don't mind. I've been filming this and through the viewfinder, I am seeing glorious pseudobulbs, but that's just me. I want to say thank you if you're still here at this point in time. And I really hope that, well, if you're here, that it was of interest to you. And once again, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you feel that I've missed something out that is important and of value to the subject of pseudobulbs, please use the comment section and let us all know about it. I would love to fill the Orchid Lingo playlist with as much information for the layman as possible. When it comes to prose, even better. If you're still watching this, give us everything that you have, leave it in the comments below and let everybody know what it is about these beautiful structures called pseudobulbs that I may have missed today. Your time is very much appreciated. Have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye. Bye.